Okay. Hello. Welcome. My name is Sarah Woodin and this is the fourth webinar in the webinar series Disability and Health Inequalities in Times of COVID-19. Um, I'm from the Disability Study Group and we're very pleased to welcome you here. At the moment people are just coming in so um, I'm going to say a few words of introduction as people join the webinar and um, by way of introduction. There are five webinars in this series and this specific webinar is the first on disability responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we are, several of us are from the BSA, British Sociological Association's Disability Study Group and um, perhaps you can just indicate who you are. My name is Sarah Wooden, I'm one of the co-conveners and we have Janice McLaughlin, who's also a host, um, who is a BSA trustee. And then we also have um, Lindsay Henry, who's from the BSA on the technical side. Um, from our side on Zoom, we cannot see you. Uh, we, we, we can't actually see who you are, but we're very pleased to observe that you have decided to attend this webinar, so welcome. Uh, for one thing I would say is we have got better at managing Zoom and webinars, but, um, if, but thank you in advance for your understanding and patience for any technological and human glitches that might take place during the webinar. Um, we hope it will be successful, but we, we never know, and we have um, quite a lot of connections to make, so thanks for, in advance for any um, problems that we might face. We're going to, um, just to let you know that we're going to input the transcript as people talk um, on this, the transcript of the slides into the chat box. So the chat box will not be usable during the course of this webinar. So please don't um, use it for that because um, uh, th th there will be information going in there. Now I know that some people find it annoying to see a lot of activity in the chat box. If that's a problem for you, please uh, click the chat box and then that, it, that will allow it to pop out. And then once it's popped out, you can make it smaller or larger or move the chat box so that it doesn't move to um, where you don't want it, for example, on top of the slides. And they shouldn't pop up in that way. Um, but we're using that for accessibility uh, purposes. The webinar is being recorded and it will be available in a few weeks time on the YouTube channel of the BSA and all the presenters as well, are very happy to be contacted um, for further information. Today we have uh, four, uh, sorry, three presentations today because unfortunately one of the presenters has had to pull out and um, that, that's a shame, but it gives us a little bit more time for the others. Uh, and we will run the presentations what, straight one after the other. Um, as we go along, um, if you have a question, please could you write all of your questions that you have for the presenters in the Q&A box that you should see at the bottom. So if you have a, a question for presenter one, um, please put it in straight away, even though we won't get around to putting the questions until the end of the, uh, until the end of all of the presentations. Um, and uh, we will, we will pick it up then. That's just simply to save time. Right. I'd like to introduce our presenters. The, um, the, the three are Shruti, Venkatcha, Venkatcha, Catcher lamp, sorry, Ven Catcher 
Bachelam, my apologies, Shruti, from the University of Bristol. Her presentation is on managing emotions and its impact in performing gender roles among people with disabilities. Ways forward in working solutions for COVID-19 response. Our second presenters are three, Andrea Lafour, Bob Green and Ryan Brown from the University of Illinois at Chicago and they will be talking on Peer Health Navigators Speak Out during COVID-19. Our third presenter is Josephine Foubert from the Office of National Statistics, who will be presenting information on coronavirus and the social impacts on disabled people in Great Britain. Um, that's my introduction. Perhaps can we move over now to the first presentation? and I will be sharing my screen um, and Shruti will be presenting the, um, so a couple of minutes while I just get this set up. Okay, the first slide is up now. Yes. Um, hello all. Um, uh, good evening. Um, my name is Shruti um, and uh, today's presentation is about managing emotions and its impact in, uh, in sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, managing emotions and its impact in performing gender roles among persons with disabilities, way forward in working, uh, um, I mean, ways forward in uh, working solutions for COVID-19 response. Um, uh, before I start my presentation, I, uh, I just uh, uh, spare me if I'm like pausing now and then because I'm, uh, I'm little like, uh, I, I feel a little anxious and uh, yeah, I think again, it's it's one of the like impact of this COVID that's been like bothering. So can you like uh, forgive me on that? So um, the interest uh, or the need for, uh, to, uh, for me to look into this particular uh, uh, issue uh, 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 started from uh, I mean started like when I was reflecting my own life uh, being a woman with a uh, disability and uh, who has been uh, uh, um, uh, yeah currently I'm in India like I have come for my field work and uh, I was uh, I'm stuck here uh, because of this COVID and uh, so all those things like contributed in like uh, reflecting uh, uh, on uh, on some of the emotions that I've uh, I'm, uh, like I've been going through so I thought to uh, kind of uh, investigate more about it with other uh, disabled uh, friends and that's how like this project like uh, we started with a few other uh, people. Um, so I'll just go into the present uh, I mean, slides now. Uh, so uh, Sarah, the next slide. Uh, Sarah. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'll um, I'll just. Uh, would like to give a brief background about the situation. Uh, so this presentation is like, uh, it's about the uh, Indian context. And uh, to start with, the understanding of disability in India largely stems out of uh, medical and religious uh, lens rather than social and human rights lens. Uh, people with the disabilities in India experience multiple marginalization due to various um, inter uh, interlocking identities like caste uh, slash race, which I forgot to mention in the uh, slide, uh, class, gender, religion, education, uh, urban rural setting, and so on. 
Um, according to uh, Census 2011 data on disability, uh, uh, sorry, according to Census 2011 uh, disability uh, um, data, there are around uh, uh, 26.8 million people with disabilities in India, out of which seven, more than 70% of them live in rural areas. Uh, next slide, Sarah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, 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 so this slide uh, it, uh, um, broadly speaks about different barriers that people with disabilities uh, experience in their uh, everyday life. Uh, one is uh, people with disabilities experience multiple barriers in terms of attitudinal, structural, so when I say structure, uh, structural barriers, it refers to infrastructure, transport, um, and so on. Uh, and also communicational uh, and informational barriers that, la that greatly impede and restrict in accessing and exercising the basic human rights. The dominant practice, the dominant patriarchal practice uh, in India and the intersectional markers um, uh, greatly impacts the experience of women with disabilities. Uh, the legal and policy framework in India, uh, the legal and policy framework on gender and disability in India have grave pitfalls in addressing the intersectional concerns that people with disabilities experience and in specifically women with disabilities. Um, uh, along with that, there are also other um, issues uh, such as poverty, unemployment, uh, institutionalization, uh, inadequate social protection, absence of uh, disaggregated data, which further um, marginalizes uh, um, people with disabilities. Next slide. Okay. Shruti, can yeah. you hear us? Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, can I uh, get that uh, slide name? The, this one is Key Concerns and Challenges During COVID-19. Okay. Is that the yeah. right one? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. So um, in this slide, like I'll, uh, I, um, I would like to speak about the key concerns and challenges during uh, COVID-19 that people with disabilities are uh, experiencing. Um, first of all, there is a uh, loss of job, ex uh, especially people who work in unorganized sectors, um, cut down in pay, um, um, in many, for, uh, people who have been employed in many uh, non-public sectors, their salaries have been reduced to 50%. Uh, um, no support to, uh, sorry, uh, no access to care support. So uh, we have been having strict lockdown measures for the last four months. So uh, people uh, who provide uh, care support are unable to um, um, uh, perform their duties um, and no access to, um, and, and absence of accessible uh, information and communication that are authentic because there are many informations that, that gets uh, many, many misinformation and myths that have been uh, circulated uh, uh, about COVID. Uh, in addition to that, there are also um, uh, uh, problems related to food security, access to healthcare services, 
um, it, uh, uh, education, uh, social protection, and uh, most importantly, there is increased rate of domestic violence and abuse among uh, people with disabilities. Um, the existing mental health support is also uh, um, also uh, adds um, further layer uh, of um, um, uh, yeah further layer of um, um, sorry yeah the the existing mental health uh, support is uh, in a, uh, is is expensive inaccessible insensitive and insufficient so in that sense uh, there are uh, um, i mean uh, when compared to the population of the country the availability of mental health uh, services is far uh, uh, i mean the ratio is uh, is very uh, is disproportionate and there are very few uh, mental health care uh, support services who specifically like are sensitive about uh, uh, disability related concerns. So um, in order to uh, address uh, uh, some of the issues, uh, um, uh, me, uh, sorry, myself and along with uh, two other um, members, like uh, one uh, is, uh, is trained in uh, uh, psychology and the other person is trained in psychiatry. So we three of us, we decided to run a support group for uh, people with uh, vision uh, disabilities and people with locomotor disabilities. Um, so the aim of this support group was to create a safe space where people, uh, where people could, uh, people with disabilities could talk about their emotions that are both helpful and, and unhelpful during this uh, COVID situation. So the main aim of the support group was to understand and address different emotions that we uh, uh, that impact our uh, interaction with our family members, friends, and surroundings. Uh, so each uh, support group it consists of thirty to forty uh, part, uh, like uh, participants. Uh, and the, uh, whose age group spans between 20 years to 55 years. And the participants uh, belong to uh, rural, urban, and uh, small towns. So during, uh, so initially when we uh, were running the support group, so for first two months, uh, uh, we, uh, the support group, uh, we, uh, uh, we had uh, um, uh, meeting like once a week uh, where, uh, um, where all the participants, including uh, um, myself and other two uh, members, we, uh, we, 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 we got, we, we, we gathered online uh, through Zoom platform and we discussed, uh, uh, around, uh, I mean, we shared and we discussed around different emotions that were uh, 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 bothering us. So during the discussion, uh, um, uh, many uh, people uh, came up with many uh, challenges and emotions that they were fa uh, like uh, facing through. So I uh, I would like to uh, mention some of the challenges. So one uh, there was uh, uh, so I'm uh, so whatever I'm sharing here has been shared by uh, many of the uh, group members. Like many felt the same. So uh, one uh, there was extreme and heightened sense of isolation and loneliness uh, due to lockdown measures. And second thing. Uh, um, there was increased sense of anxiety where uh, participants were constantly thinking about the past, present, and the future. 
for example like uh, they have uh, they they uh, they were saying that whether i'll be able to function as before and another uh, 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 issue was uh people shared that uh they the people shared uh, uh, a sense of fear in uh, performing their everyday routine uh, uh tasks to meet their basic needs uh for example like uh, participants were sharing like um uh, before this covid uh, they were uh, independent they were able to manage their uh, routine uh, i'm i mean they they were able to uh, meet their um, basic needs by uh, uh, like going out for uh, grocery shopping and things like that but now this covid situation has greatly uh, affected their uh, sense of uh, independence because they are scared to step out of the house especially uh, um, uh, uh, this was uh, like uh, repeatedly emphasized uh in the group of people who had vision impairment because they were saying like I i'm scared to step out of the house because i don't know who uh, like would uh, uh um, i mean who would come near me i i'm i won't be able to uh, see through the i mean uh, i won't do uh, i won't be able i mean i i i don't know like who's sitting next to me or who's standing beside me so i'm very scared to step out of the house and uh, people uh, uh, like were also sharing that uh, sharing a few uh, statements which reflected that people were self blaming for the situation like for example people were saying that i feel uh, bad that i am not able to perform so and so because of this uh, because now i'm sit uh, like uh, sitting at home so uh like rather than looking it as a pandemic people were thinking that it is something to do with the, the people were taking responsibility for this situation and they were self blaming themselves for not doing the things that they were doing before and there was uh, and, and some of them were also uh, getting passive in terms of um they were letting others like uh, especially the other uh, non disabled uh, family members to take control of them and the other issue that was shared was people were also uh, people had also fear and anxiety of falling sick or whether the already Uh, existing illness would get intense because of this uh, uh, situation and they were also uh, scared to go uh, um and, and and people were also uh, sharing that uh, when they go out they are not getting adequate support from uh, uh, from others because people are scared to touch so this was shared by person who uh is who has locomotor disability he, uh, he he's a wheelchair user and he was saying that like when i step out of the house like uh, um um uh, before covid people used to uh, come and help me uh, especially when i go to a shop or something but now like people are scared to come near me so uh, so that makes a little difficult in uh, performing my tasks uh next slide so um so in this slide i'll be speaking about the uh, key uh, emotional challenges uh, that were shared by uh, uh, women with uh, disabilities in specific uh so um so when we were have uh, having the support group we also had few sessions which were uh, uh, which were conducted uh, only with women with the disabilities uh, uh, so we we thought that would give them uh, a much more uh, safe space to open up and speak things that uh, were disturbing them so these are some of the statements that they sh uh, that was uh, shared uh i accept myself to be controlled and scolded by uh, uh family members especially the male uh, uh 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 members in the family um uh 
so that i can avoid any big fights or disruptions in the family when i have no support to seek and another uh, uh, issue that was uh, uh, sorry that was shared by few uh, women uh, where uh, so th so these were shared especially by women who were working who were who were equally contributing uh, 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 who were equally uh, financially contributing to the family uh, most of my day uh, goes in performing household chores uh doing caring responsibilities uh completing my work related uh duties but at, at at the end of the day uh whatever i have done uh becomes insignificant when compared to the male member in the family for uh, for example my husband or my brother so this was uh shared uh and another uh, uh issue that came up was uh women shared that i have no room to express my feelings uh and i often hear and i'm and i'm often told that it doesn't make any much difference in my lifestyle because of this covid as i was already uh, as i'm already used to sitting at home even before the covid uh another uh, issue that was shared was uh i'm i'm scared to express my emotions and feelings with my family members uh uh because i'm already uh, uh because i already have no voice in my family so now when i say it out i uh, i'm scared that whether i would be cornered for any disruptions or um uh, disputes in the family uh another issue that came up was i feel worthless um when my family and surroundings ignore and normalize my uh, emotions emotional breakdowns sorry yeah so these were uh, some of the uh, challenges uh, i mean uh, yeah uh, emotional uh, um 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 uh, challenges that were uh, shared by women and uh, next slide so uh, um, so we used some of the tools and techniques uh, in the support group uh, in order to uh, um, in order to uh, uh um uh, uh, learn and uh, train the participants in better managing their uh, emotions so for that we used a combination of leadership and psychological tools uh, uh for for example like uh, um we uh, we used tools where uh, we uh, source uh, um uh, yeah we we, we, we uh, sorry we used tools that uh, where, where, where participants were able to um uh, identify the universal values that they stand for and uh, uh, we we used tools that uh, uh, that dealt with uh, listening techniques and uh, some of the um, and in, uh, and some of the uh, affirmation tools were also uh, i mean uh, techniques were also uh, used uh, in uh, in the support group so in that process like uh, the following questions were asked to the past, uh, to the participants in order to uh, reflect and um, explore uh, one, uh, the the inner self uh sarah could you please like uh, read out the questions sure the questions are what do i care about for myself and others what are some of the issues that bother me what can i do differently what needs to change in me <clears throat> in my family in my society how can i help my family and how can my family help me what will i do to help myself my family and society what will i do to sustain and what have i learned yeah and truly we're we're running close to time now so 
Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm about to finish. So next slide. Yeah, so uh, in this slide, I'll speak about uh, broadly the outputs and the outcomes. And uh, to, uh, to let you all know that the support group is still on. Uh, we we uh, um, uh, So we are planning to run the group for some more uh, time. Uh, so uh, whatever, uh, so I've, um, I've mentioned few uh, uh, points here that uh, that was, uh, I mean, I've uh, um, compiled based on uh, uh, participants' feedback and, uh, and yeah, uh, and participants like whatever they have been sharing in, uh, uh, in the support group. Um, and to, uh, yeah, so I think I forgot to mention this. So initially, like, as I said, we were meeting uh, for, uh, once in a week, but after two months, we started, uh, like, meeting uh, once in fortnight. So, um, and uh, so that we are aware, aware. so uh, I think uh, this till this July, because it was started in uh, April. So for April and May, we were meeting once a week and uh, June and July, like we are mean, uh, meeting um, uh, like uh, once in two weeks. So from next uh, month, we'll be meeting a month. Uh, so slowly we are just trying to, uh, um, yeah, see the uh, change. Uh, so, uh, um, from from the participants' uh, uh, feedback, like we uh, we could see that the participants are able to understand and accept the current uh, situation and move from stifling spaces to nurturing sp spaces that foster uh, safety and well-being of all. Um, uh, um, women uh, participants, especially, they move. Uh, they are able to move from hiding spaces to uh, to to space where they could uh, sh uh, talk about. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh... Sorry, I'll just uh, repeat that. So women, uh, women uh, participants are uh, able to uh, move from um, silence and to speak about the uh, things that disturbs them. And uh, participants are able to notice the difference and shift in the conversation when uh, they are able to uh, uh, source their inner potential and be in action. Uh, which reflects their values that they stand for and when they notice their fears. Uh, and as uh, mainly like participants are able to transcend from the past to the present and uh, take forward the learnings that they had from the past in redefining the goals that uh, for the present. Um, and uh, the uh, and uh, another main uh, uh, thing is like uh, v uh, women participants are able to move from accepting the internalized gender roles uh, to a space where they are able to co-create and um, share the roles with the uh, other members in the house. Yeah. So with that, I would like to uh, end my presentation. I'm so sorry for uh, 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 for like pauses here and there. And uh, if there are any questions or any uh, uh, clarifications, like yeah, I can take it at the end. And you could also like contact me uh, over, through my e uh, email ID. Thank you so much. Great, thank you very much, Suruti. And um, do note any um, questions that you have um, in the Q and A's. Can we move on uh, now and invite um, Andrea, Ryan, and Bob to share their presentation, please? Hello, everyone. On behalf of our research team, thank you for allowing us. Oops. Thank you for allowing us to join you in this very important conversation. My name is Andrea LaFleur, 
and I'm the clinical supervisor of the Our Peers Empowerment and Navigational Support Research Study at the University of Illinois at Chicago. OPENS is a 12-month peer support intervention where highly trained people with disabilities work with other people with disabilities one-on-one -on -one to help them break down barriers to healthcare. We use a social determinants of health informed approach that recognizes that things like transportation, food and housing security and disability service access are vital to overall health. Um, now two of our amazing PHNs will share briefly about their background and their COVID informed insights into the need for and value for peer support. So we'll start with Bob. Uh, hi, um, my name is Bob Green and I had a, um, my disability is um, the result of hemorrhagic stroke of the anterior corpus callosum. Um, my disability is acquired as opposed to being congenital. Um, I ended up in the program because I was in vocational um, therapy and uh, the opportunity to work with Dr. Magassi um, presented itself. Um, since that time, I've um, been able to work with people with disabilities and understand and understand what that means as a person who, who, who functioned in society without disabilities initially. Um, it, it provided me with uh, an empathetic uh, perspective of, of, of my clients. And um, that, that has helped a, a great deal. What I'd like to do though is give you a, uh, I'd like to give you a perspective of what we do as, as navigators um, and, and some suggestions that, um, that I'd like to put forward um, in, in terms of societal attitudes toward uh, people with disabilities. What we don't want to do is lose the disability gains that we've fought so hard to obtain over the years. Uh, since COVID-19, social services have, have become increasingly inaccessible to people with disabilities. For example, accessing services at, at a driver's license facility, that will require long lines with no chairs. Um, hey, Bob, I hate to interrupt. I, um, if it's okay, let's have Ryan, Ryan share a little bit about her background first, and then we'll loop back around. I just want to make sure you're both introduced. Oh, okay, gotcha. Thanks. Uh, Ryan, go ahead and give your background if you are on. Good, good afternoon. My name is Ryan Brown, and I became disabled as a result of gun violence in the city of Chicago in 2006. I sustained a gun, gunshot wound to the left side of my head, and as a result, I was diagnosed with a traumatic brain injury. The next 10 years were very challenging, trying to adjust to my new normal while navigating the system to find resources for disabled individuals. I eventually became pretty good at locating the right resources for me as well as others. And in 2016, I applied for and was hired for the research position at, at, of PHN at USC. Thanks, Ryan. And you can uh, continue with our takeaways from COVID-19. Oh. So this is um, Ryan, and then Bob, you'll be next. Okay, gotcha. Um, am I on? You're on, Ryan. The first issue is exclusion. Um, disabled people are left out as a whole, we are left to fend for ourselves during COVID-19. We, I even had to help somebody get PPE because they, they didn't have access to them. Um, let, me, let me share with you my story. Uh, um, I have, I'm a, I'm a mother, I'm a mother and, I'm a mother, student and an employee. 
So dealing with that full-time parent um, is is very hard when I'm not able to do as much for my um, daughter. Um, like during during the COVID-19, it was very hard for me to get um, at-home support for my daughter. I had to use my, I had to do it all on my own because um, at the time, at at this time, peop, uh, my my the people who usually help me with her when I, me and her are at home together, um, they're at work. My sister and my mother. Um, so I'm at home with my one year old out of daycare. Um, and, and I had to just uh, adjust. It was a big adjustment for me. Um, as a PHN, I know I've experienced the, the challenges of navigating the healthcare system. Um, like, we don't only deal with health care. We deal with health, your health as a whole as um, so, um, we, we deal with the social economical aspect of it. Um, and the, it, a big issue during this COVID-19 was um, this, disabled people are, were already isolated. The pandemic made this much worse. Um, for one of my peers, therapy was their only outing, and now not even that. Um, our past experience re experiences reinforced that people with disabilities do not feel valued in society. As PHNs, we provide a sounding board for our peers to express their feelings, ideas, and opinions about what is going on in the in society, and this made them feel valued. Um, another um, barrier was tech technology barriers, um, especially with the new telehealth visits. Um, they are so impersonal. It's not like they were personal. The, our doctor's appointments and therapy appointments was personal to begin with, but it it was it was more hands on. And now I couldn't during 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 the therapy session I was having um, during this pandemic a telehealth therapy session. I couldn't even uh, she couldn't even measure the spasticity of my arm. Um, I, I didn't feel like that was a solution. The telehealth is too impersonal and we already feel isolated. Um, another big problem is uh, transportation issues. And um, it, it's just the transportation here is called pace paratransit that we have to that that is op that's the op that's that's my that's that's our, our that is our option here in Chicago um, for disabled people and what it is is it's a door to door pickup but pickup service and drop off service they pick you up at the do at your at your home or any place any any address you want you want them to pick you up at but the downside of that is that we're we're treated like we could we're not important like our lives don't matter um and we we ha we we're left to figure things out on our own while um while waiting on our ride and they could be up to two hours I waited two hours for a ride one day, and I would, and and that made 
And my example of the of, of pace paratransit lack of empathy is I had a job interview one day um, back in December, and they um, I feel like I they made me miss my job interview, and I feel like I it, it's impossible for me to get a full time job and this um without the pandemic because the transportation system is so jacked up um another thing that's going on during this pandemic is if we didn't have enough um this black lives move matter movement with heightened awareness of racial violence, like um, PHNs added a layer of support and validation for our peers that also face discrimination from other marginalized identities like race, gender, sexual, sexual orientation, and so on. We continue to offset these challenges as we have shared experiences and experiences with advocacy. Bob. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, Ex executing interventions has shown that certain issues recur and there is a there there are certain things that um, that we need to really watch out to watch out for to protect uh, to protect the gains that we've made as a uh, as a member of uh, the disability community um, since COVID-19, social services have been increasingly inaccessible for people with disabilities. For example, services at driver's license facilities require long waits with no chairs. Policies cannot perpetuate or, tr or trend, sh policies cannot perpetuate the trend of excluding people with disabilities. Government and policy making must include the voices of people with disabilities. Access to voting places and accommodations for people with disabilities are essential. For example, voting by mail will be, will be important will be an, an important convenience for some people, but not people with disabilities who can't get to the post office or mailbox. Partnerships and networking at every level of policymaking and government are vital. COVID has, COVID has heightened awareness of mental health needs as well. The pandemic, ex, the pandemic exacerbated the isolation felt by many peers. Um, PHNs, provided, PHNs have provided emotional and social support and were and were an outlet for peers to share to share their feelings. Um, knowledge, knowledge of technology, accessibility features, and accessibility features is a priority for people to use and, and access web, webinars and trainings to stay informed. Uh, decreased funds for policing should be redirected to disability issues. We try to help our peers discover what they want for help, uh, for health goals. The, the PHN program also helps to identify and clarify the things in their life that prevent them from achieving these goals. Uh, we also help to identify possible solutions for circumventing or removing barriers. Uh, we might have lost oh. your audio. Oh, there you are. Okay. Um, 
let me let me see. So so we we try to identify and clarify the things in their life in their lives that prevent them from achieving those health goals. Um, we we help them source resources that can help them with their problems. Hopefully empower our peers and ability and confidence to methodically define and resource information that help them that help them um, self advocate. The the COVID pandemic in this political uh, environment has has harshly highlighted the erosion of disability of the disability community's uh, past gains. Divisive politics have trended toward ex exclusion and bias. However, through that darkness, we see the evidence of bold spirit, determination, empathy, and compassion, the foundations of a great society and community. The common experiences of PHNs with their peers help counter the pain and isolation of discrimination, especially at this crucial time. Our struggles with COVID, shall we still have the spirit and character of the 1990 protesters that gave, that gave us the American Disabilities Act? We must use that spirit to establish and maintain new norms of disability rights, which are civil rights. So every single person can say, I am a member of society, I have value, and I matter. Uh, thank you, and that's that. that that's the, my presentation. Great, thank you very much. Is that the end of your presentation? Thank you. Yes. Another great uh, presentation on. Um, on importance of peer support. Thank you so much. We are running a bit over time and I know how tough it is to kind of try and pull things together. Josephine, I was going to suggest we go till five for your, um, uh, and then those who can stay on for questions afterwards. Um, I don't like to overrun the five, but I also don't want to um, cut you short either. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine for me. Okay, thanks. I will go ahead and share my screen. Um, all right. Um, so uh, I'm Josephine of the Census and Disability Analysis Team of um, the Office for National Statistics in the UK. And in the next couple of minutes, I will present you the work we've been doing in the last months. Uh, to document the social impacts of disabled people in Great Britain. Now, um, to start, I would like to share this slide and quote of the National Statistician, which also displays um, why um, ONS really values the work we're doing and, and the topic we're, we're, we're working on. Is he says it's vital to understand the needs of everyone in our society as people's experience throughout this pandemic will differ. And this analysis gives insight into the experience of disabled people and where there might be issues um, that arise for some that differ from those for non disabled people. It is actually also important to state that at the end, this actually this quote goes on in the publication stating that we also recognize that uh, our analysis only hides the main trends and also summarizes the, the experience of the disabled people because it's a group that it covers uh, also a broad and complex range of, uh, of conditions. So personal experience can also differ of this, but we, we try to pinpoint and map uh, largest trends we see. So what have we been doing in the last months? We have started to create an, a, a series of articles to understand the social impact of the pandemic on disabled adults and compare their situation to non-disabled adults, but also where possible, um, we show where different impairment types might play a role and show differences across uh, different disabled adults. 
The articles have highlighted actually a range of topics going from uh, concerns of the impact on life in general, well-being, coping strategies, perception of support, but also giving support and community spirits to impact on finance, etc. In the results, I will focus on two main sections, but please do go and have a look uh, at our publications and the data sets we publish with it because they cover a broader range of topics. Now, what is interesting is that we have covered um, different pandemic periods. So the first article uh, documented the early lockdown phase with data of March and April 2020. While the second article documents May 2020, where that in the UK and in Great Britain, there had been a first easing of rules. So people were allowed to go outdoors a bit more uh, than what previously had been advised. And the third article we're working on at the moment, of which I can't share any results yet, uh, will document July. Uh, and the data is being collected now, which, uh, yeah, of course has a further relaxation of rules in the UK. Now how do we do this? We have been using data of the opinions and lifestyle survey which is usually a monthly survey to gather a range of opinions data in Great Britain. However um, to document actually the impact of the coronavirus pandemic ONS has adapted this survey to become a weekly survey so with a quick turnaround, we can have some insight into how people are feeling week by week. The topics have changed. Some have been recurrent, like well-being, impact on work and finances. But uh, now, for example, we also try to collect data on the future of the country and feelings about that, the use of PPA, support for government guidelines and leaving home. Uh, to put it, Shortly, the sample size we use at the moment is relatively small. Uh, between 2,000 to 2,500 per week, uh, people are being collected, um, which doesn't enable us to always provide the breakdowns we would want. They're like combinations of intersectional uh, status of being disabled and female uh, is not always possible with the data we have. Um, what is, might be more of interest to you is um, that we use the following uh, disability definition. It's the government statistical service definitions which sees people as disabled if they have a self-reported long-standing illness condition or impairment that reduces their ability to carry out day-to-day -day activities, where the long-standing element is uh, understood as being more than 12 months. Um, this definition is also used across government to measure rights uh, under the Equality Act for Disability. Where possible, I will point you towards differences in impairment types, and we make a distinction between 10 impairment types at the moment, saying uh, ranging from vision to hearing, over to learning and memory-related impairments, mental health, social behavioural and other. Now, to start, I will first discuss um, some trends we saw related to well-being. In early lockdowns, so that refers to March and April uh, this year, we saw that almost half of disabled adults in Great Britain reported being very worried about the effect coronavirus was having on their life in general. Uh, if we then added the people who were um, somewhat worried or very worried um, to this group, then we could say nearly nine in ten disabled adults uh, were very were very worried or somewhat worried about the effect it was having on their life. Now, luckily enough, in May this decreased to just over uh, seven in ten disabled adults, so there was somehow a positive evolution uh, in that account. Now, if we looked into the reasons why people were worried about the effect that was coronavirus was having on their life, uh, we could say that for disabled people, they indicated both in April and May, it was the fact that you were, they were unable to make plans and their well-being was affected uh, as the two largest groups. And that was uh, mainly the main concerns. 
What is also interesting is to see that the availability of groceries, medication and other essential was being affected for them as well. And uh, that is was especially so in April, so the first kind of lockdown phase. And in, in May, that this was uh, not so shared among the group while it's still being quite high in general. Now, uh, what is interesting to see is that and that's what you see on the red bars on this graph, that um, well-being being affected as a reason why they worried about the effect coronavirus had on their life uh, was especially very high among people with social, behavioral, mental health and memory-related impairments. So those people were among the most that indicated their well-being was affected. Uh, it was lower among people um, with dexterity, mobility, and hearing-related impairments. Uh, on the other hand, for the, those groups, actually, uh, the access to grocery, medication, and essential was uh, among their greatest concerns. Now, because uh, well-being seemed to be one of the main things affected uh, throughout uh, these periods, we also looked into the reasons how their well-being was being affected. And there we saw that in April, around a third of disabled adults reported spending too much time alone uh, compared to only around a fifth of non-disabled adults as being one of the reasons uh, where life was affected. So obviously for both disabled and non-disabled people, everyone worried about the future, felt stressed and anxious, perhaps felt a bit bored. But for disabled adults, what stood out compared to non-disabled adults was feeling actually the, the feeling that you spend too much time alone. Now we kept on monitoring that and saw that in April, uh, people still felt uh, worried about the future, felt stressed and anxious, but was particularly poignant in May that disabled people were more likely than in April to indicate they felt lonely in addition. So uh, instead of the, the lockdown rules being eased a little bit, it did feel that uh, people still felt lonely and, and perhaps even more so because other people were um, leaving the house so this is of course a hypothesis but it's something we want to keep and on um, having a look at um, we also looked into more standardized uh, versions of well-being scales and with this one i would particularly want to point your attention to the anxiety measure at the bottom so we compared the anxiety levels of people also uh, with the period before the pandemic. So that's the gray bar of June 2019. And uh, you can see that for disabled people, both in April, which is the blue bar, and in May, the red bar, their levels were still, their anxiety level was still higher than in June. While it had dropped in May, the level had still not normalized, so to speak. Um, so even now, uh, we, we are going to keep on having a look at that in the last article we're doing. Um, what was also interesting to see again is that the average anxiety ratings varied among disabled people. So um, people with mental health impairments, social behavioral learning uh, impairments, seem to report higher anxiety levels compared to people with dexterity or mobility rated uh, impairments. Now, uh, I'm going to go to the second part of the presentation of the results, which is more about leaving home. So this uh, will be dominantly based on the results we shared in May. And there we saw as a first thing that uh, in the last seven days before we collected the data, about 75% of disabled people reported leaving their home compared to almost 93% of non-disabled people. So that was quite a significant difference. And also the reasons for leaving home seem to differ to a certain extent. So obviously, um, as you see on the top of the graph, most people, whether they were disabled or non-disabled, left their home for basic necessities for exercise. 
Now, what we saw, particularly for disabled adults, that actually the main third reason they left the house for was for medical needs or to provide care or help to other vulnerable people or to vulnerable people. So um, in that way, it was interesting for us to see that perhaps disabled people uh, left their home maybe less for pleasure, but more for responsibilities uh, they had. So that is something uh, we want to continue looking into. Uh, again, some differences uh, across uh, disabled people. 80% of people with a mental health impairments had left their home past seven days, uh, which was quite a bit higher than uh, people with hearing, mobility or memory uh, impairments. Now, perhaps this might be a difference which is always true, irrespective of the pandemic, but it's um, for us at least also something we want to keep um, looking at. So to see that in a way, perhaps uh, certain services uh, could also be necessary uh, to a different extent for different groups of impairments. So it's something we want to keep on um, looking at as, the, as an office or a team. Um, in addition, what could be interesting to share as well is that um, in May, only a quarter of disabled people had reported visiting parts of public green space compared to 46% of non-disabled people. Uh, again, people with mental health impairments reported visiting green spaces more compared to people with hearing dexterity or mobility impairments. So at least there's a, at least that same kind of uh, distinction visible again. Um, now, perhaps one of the reasons why people might be leaving their home less, disabled people leaving their home less, might be because of safety perceptions be related to the coronavirus pandemic. We saw that in May, one in 10 disabled people felt very unsafe outside at their home because of the coronavirus pandemic. So this compared to fewer than one in 20 for non-disabled people, which is quite uh, a stark difference. Um, yeah, and it's something uh, uh, we, 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 in a way, must try to try to understand a bit better. Now, while I would like to share way more results with you, I think it's uh, probably a good moment to, to, to stop the presentation of results, but I would like to point you to other topics we've explored and published uh, next to our article. You can find them in the link in the presentation. We've also documented working from home, self-isolating, uh, impact on work, finances, homeschooling, other kind of things. Uh, it could also be interesting to point you into the direction of our disability page, which is uh, our home page on the Office for National Statistics websites, which includes our previous articles around different outcomes for disabled people in the UK. And we've also included a link on our most recent publication uh, on which other themes have worked related to coronavirus related deaths by disability status, which uses data of uh, the census, census 2011. Now, um, so please feel free to share any feedback and suggestions. We're still working on this series as well. Um, the next article will be covering July 2020. We'll compare things over time and, and highlight new topics where relevant for the current situations. And you can expect this to be published around mid-August. Um, I will have to leave quite soon at five, but please feel free to send any feedback, ask questions to the live.course at ones.gov.uk uh, email address, uh, which is our team uh, email inbox. So yeah, thank you very much. I'm happy to stop sharing and open the floor. Thank you very much indeed, Josephine. That's a really interesting uh, uh,
presentation and great really to have disability statistics because often we're, we're so lacking, lacking in those. Um, now, Janice, I think, is going to take on board um, the, 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 the Q&As, but if you have to dash off really quickly, Josephine, can I be cheeky and just come in with a quick um, question about statistics, because I am particularly interested in those. Just wondered yeah. if, um, did your, does your data include disabled people in care homes? Um, no. No, it will not. So the sampling is 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 not taking into care homes. Uh, we have been, I think, other people within the division have been trying to incorporate more insights of people in care homes. Um, so um, if you are really interested in that, I can probably point you into the right direction in an email. Great, thank you. <clears throat> and I know you also have. I mean, uh, this isn't the subject of your. Um, presentation but I know or you also have data on um, the death statistics and, and so on is another strand of ONS which I mentioned that that here but but I know you didn't present on that today but yeah would be interested in the care home stuff thank you I'll follow it up but can I pass over now to Janice does that make sense Janice yep, yep pick up on some of the Q&A's thanks so much um, so hopefully people can hear me and thanks for um, the questions that were coming through in Q&A and apologies, I won't be able to get to all of them. Um, but we'll start um, with the first presentation and there were some questions there. Um, one was about the context of India, Shruti, um, and what is the law in India in relation to disability? Is there legal protection support for disabled people there? Um, but also he was interested in the context of you um, studying in Bristol and, and how different that was or, or wasn't. Um, and also um, Laura wanted to know a little bit more, uh, which I think links to the first question about where the research took place and maybe saying a little bit about the research dynamic you were involved with there. And then for our second group of presenters from the US, um, we had a, a question about um, that was specific to well, it was, it was raised for Bob, but I think any of the three of you could answer, which was um, the way that you thought about and talked about yourself as being disabled since you had your stroke um, and whether you thought that um, if you wore glasses before the stroke and if you thought about glasses as being an assistive technology, um, whether that distinction between disabled and non-disabled um, it works um, if you want to say anything about that. Um, and also a question about, it was very interesting to hear all the challenges that you are facing um, in the US, which we, we we're seeing um, here in the UK too. And clearly this very strong role that the peers are playing to support others. But I also wondered about the support for yourselves and how that peer support work is supported during such an incredibly challenging time, which I think is writ large across the US and in cities like Chicago. Um, so they were the present the questions for both presentations. Bob, you might have something to say before me, but I can also share about what our team how our team has adapted for um, self care. Yeah. Uh, does Shruti want to go first, uh, though, and then come to you? Or? Yeah. Uh, am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, to talk about the uh, legal, um, I mean, laws in India, uh, I, um, I mean, as I said, with uh, like how the disability is understood in India, I think it also reflects the laws that we have here. Uh, till 2016, uh, we had, uh, um, I mean, the, uh, we, we had our first disability legislation in 1995, which was active till 2016. So that law, it just addressed few uh, uh, um, issues with related to disability, like uh, education, employment, and it listed only seven types of disability. And it was purely based on medical model. 
and and that law was repealed and in 2016 we had uh, uh, we had a new law uh, which reflected more uh, uh, I, I won't say more but yeah it had uh, some of the uh, um, uh, things that has been uh, raised in UNCRPD. It was in line with uh, uh, UNCRPD in few aspects, and um, and again, in uh, again, the law speaks about uh, um, a need for medical certification, and again, it lists only twenty one types of disabilities. So that is broadly about the uh, laws on disability in India. And uh, with regard to, I think the person also asked about uh, my experience in, uh, uh, I mean, studying in Bristol. Yes, it it, it has. I mean, uh, there's so much difference, and I think I can talk about it like over email or something. And to move on to next question, um, the research um, was uh, like conducted in uh, the southern India, like in in one particular state where I reside. Um, uh, yeah, so it uh, so I think the question because it was it was just asked like what research is in uh, I mean where the research was undertaken. Uh, it was uh, I mean uh, it was uh, conducted in a southern part of India and like we and we had like quite a representation from different uh, intersectional background. Oh, yes, I think I have answered. Thank you. There was a slight follow up just very quickly about um, how and whether you how you undertook field work within COVID. So were these support sessions online or were they um, face to face and how did that work? Uh, yeah, I think Sorry. Yes, uh, the sub, uh, the support groups uh, is being conducted online and through Zoom platform. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so back to our second uh, group of presenters and the questions that uh, you had there. Oh, on, on mute. Thank you. Thank Bob you. And Ryan, if you have anything to share first, um, you have lived it firsthand as well. Oh, go, go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Um, so a few things that we adapted as far as um, the process, you know, as soon as COVID hit, um, we're, we're instructed to call our, our peers at least once a, a month. That changed to once a week at the very beginning of COVID, just to make sure that people had support, had somebody in their corner to talk to. Um, and our, our PHNs really uh, felt, as a team, we felt the weight of um, the, and the gravity that people were experiencing in, these, in this transition of the lack of social contact, the concern with getting access to resources. Um, and so that was a heavy weight on our, on our team. Um, ways that we incorporated self-care and and that throughout the intervention um, our PHN team typically meets every other week um, but we also made uh, weekly call, outreach calls to each other um, we had a social evening zoom uh, once every few weeks with uh, some of our old team members that had gone off and onto other full-time work and this allowed us to just continue to have that peer support for each other um, we just in, in, ingrained little strategies as well things like humor in meetings um, one of our phns would break out in song at the end of a meeting and say the sun will come out tomorrow <laughs> just to keep the the spirits up and keep uh, people just bring some levity to the situation um, and generally we we just became much closer as a team in that you know there was a little bit more flexibility in in the time of days that we called each other or um, the types of support that we provided we just became much much closer as a team and while we were also providing that support and those self-care and mental health uh, supports to our peers I mean one of the things that Bob mentioned that the the near the end of the presentation was this concern that disability rights could end up falling back in the US and it's certainly a concern that's been raised in the UK. Um, what could stop that? I mean, what could, you know, you talked very eloquently, Bob, about the need to kind of engage with civil society and ensure that disabled people are seen as members, full members of, of society. How do we stop this rollback in rights that I, I can understand that we are seeing? 
political activism. That, that, that's the short of it. Thank you. We also had a, a PHN that was supposed to join us in this presentation and had some major medical and family cha uh, challenges happen this week, um, but he really has emphasized for our team that we need to be collaborating with our aldermen, collaborating with our um, local commissioners when um, people are hired on um, and we know that somebody has a background in disability or even if they don't, making those connections, making it known that, that disability rights and resources are necessary to be of top focus at this time. Um, in a lot of ways, it just felt like that was put on the back burner. Things like personal assistance not being considered essential, not having access to PPE. A lot of challenges during this time really showed the neglect for people with disabilities in our country. And so we um, continue to advocate for, for our voices to be heard and in and, and platforms where we are able to make those, those changes happen. Absolutely. I think it's going to be one of the things that we see internationally is the ways in which governmental responses have either deliberately withdrawn provision for disabled people or have inadvertently made things worse by not actually thinking about disability. It's certainly been a very live issue in the UK and we've heard it being talked about in India there just now as well. So I think that's one of the international comparators to explore as we go, go ahead. Our PHNs also will be sending out reminders and information as a part of Disability Voter Registration Week. So that's another area where, you know, we're just trying to get our peers involved so that their voice can be heard um, in a variety of contexts. Yes, you have, you have a small general, you have a small presidential election coming up in a few months. <laughs> a little bit. Good luck with that. <laughs> the world is depending on you. <laughs> Um, Sarah, I don't know if there's anything else you want to follow up with. I think I've kind of worked through most of the Q&A and some other yeah. thoughts there. Sure. There are a couple of questions that we didn't manage to answer. Sorry about that. Laura Welty asked about um, uh, whether there were perhaps more people who were um, dis disabled people who were scared to go out. Um, I know that maybe th this is just quite a short um, webinar and what I'd urge people to do is to follow up with questions and have a dialogue with with the presenters um, you know one or two questions we haven't followed up and, and some other questions for Shruti as well um, I think it's been fascinating I'm I think it's a good idea if we can follow up through email further questions um, from here um, can I say thank you so much for some really fascinating um, presentations. It's been great to meet you. It's really, really, really interesting um, in this kind of really international um, event. Um, thank you very much and I'll be in touch with the presenters and thank you very much for um, to all the attendees as well for taking the time to come. Uh, we have one more webinar scheduled at the same time in the same place next week um, on the, the similar issue but this will be on intersectionality again. And I would urge you to come to that, look in again if you can, um, and also to say that you need to register again via the BSA website um, for that event, register, um, as, as I say, independently um, for each one. Um, and uh, that's it really. Thank you very much indeed. The information will be on um, YouTube as soon as we can get it there. Thanks very much and look forward to seeing you next week. And thank you again to the presenters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.